This is series two, episode nine, and I'm delighted to be speaking with Mary and Christy. We've obviously corresponded a lot and we've, we've had extremely brief interactions over group Zoom calls, but this is the first time we get to sit down and talk properly. So I'm looking forward to it. Yes, I'm looking forward to it too. So how are you and how are you dealing with the heat wave? Having spent a large part of my life in warm countries, I love the heat. So long as I'm not actually outside at midday, but just the fact the sun is shining, skies are beautiful, weather's warm, I love this. I'm very happy in the heat. Yes, well, you're originally from Zimbabwe. Yes. Right, but this is, this is normal. Yes, I was sitting outside this morning and thinking this is actually very much like the weather I grew up with. So I like it. I like it occasionally. I don't know if I could cope with it every day of the year. I should add that, you know, another large part of my life was spent in Aberdeen. Oh, well, that's very different. Given the choice of typical Aberdonian weather or typical heat weather, I definitely prefer the heat. Yeah. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm with you there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so let's have some of your background because you studied mathematics and classics, which is a very interesting combination. Well, it was really because I couldn't make choices and I've been like that all my life. It's very hard to, if you find everything interesting, what do you choose, what do you end up doing? So yeah, I finished, uh, finished A-levels and I love Latin, we didn't have Greek at school, but I loved Latin and I loved mathematics. So I started off studying both and then got married before finishing my degree, moved countries and really had to start again. So I thought, well, I'll stick with mathematics. But classics was always there in the background and I ended up revisiting it and studying some more um, a few years ago. Yes, I, I had the same problem. I was very indecisive. I was going, I wanted to be an archaeologist. And then I, uh, during my A-levels, I, I panicked and I dropped history and took up chemistry. My, my other two A-levels were mathematics and physics. I was maths, physics, history. History went, became maths, physics, chemistry. Then when I went to university, I started studying mathematics. I did that for about two and a half months and then switched to physics. And then since then, I've just change my mind more and more often. But I've always loved mathematics and I do sometimes regret not finishing that degree. I'm, I'm pleased that I did the physics degree and lent as much as I possibly could towards the mathematical side of physics, which was largely because I was hopeless at all the practical stuff. Just everything would break as soon as I touched it. That makes me laugh because, um, yeah, I love theoretical physics too. and. and... I think had it been on offer at the University of Rhodesia, as it was at the time when I went there first, now Zimbabwe, I'd love to have done astronomy or astrophysics, but that wasn't an option. But yeah, I'm, I'm practically hopeless. Yeah, the year after I graduated, the year after they started offering a course that was just theoretical physics, and I was so annoyed. Yeah. Because I'd, I'd made a complete mess of all the practical side. We used to have these classes where you'd have a, you'd have your lab sessions, and then you, you'd have a sort of theoretical lab where everybody would get together and solve problems. And I noticed that everybody would flock around me for help with the theoretical side. And then when it came to the lab sessions, I would look around, and everybody was looking away, not wanting to be my partner. <laughs> well, I have the advantage of having a husband who's a physicist, but very practical. So whenever there's anything that needs fixing in the house or you know, plugs changing or, or whatever, then, then he does it. So I don't have to dirty my hands with the practical side of domestic physics. Yeah. Well, Clara is a lot more practical than I am, so. <laughs> <laughs> so where does your music fit in, Anthony? Because you were also a musician or are a musician. Yes. Well, I, it was, uh, I think I've talked about this on the podcast before. I was in my spare time, I was devoted to music. And then my education was all about uh, maths and, and science. So I say, well, I'm, I ended up a poet because it was, it was kind of the halfway point. I wonder how, how you feel about that, actually. 
you say you were yourself indecisive about whether it's going to the arts or or mathematics and the sciences so it's nice isn't it when you find a way to combine the two i've found that anyway and it, oh, clearly you have yes it's taken me a long time and quite a circuitous route to get here because i started writing poetry in fact i wrote my first poem when i was five and wrote poetry through my teens you know typical teenage emotive poetry and then I suppose when I got married I became very happy and I didn't need to write emotive poetry anymore and didn't write poetry for years and years and years until until I retired and thought hmm what should I do with myself and looked at some courses looked at OU courses discovered there were some interesting courses did some more mathematics, theoretical physics, classics, and creative writing. That's how I fell into creative writing, if you like. And then was the realization that actually you can you can wed the two together. You can wed poetry and mathematics together and all sorts of interesting and exciting things can happen. It would take me quite a few years to get to this point. <laughs> Well, I think that the part of the trouble is that everybody, not everybody, but most people would associate poetry with emotive works, uh, lyrical expressionism. And as certainly my education was in English was based on that. And it, it's it's often overlooked that, you, that poetry is much more than just lyricism, that there's, there's there are plenty of avenues that you can that you can explore that don't necessarily prioritize emotions. I mean, emotions are always there, I think, but you can prioritize form instead, which I guess is something that appeals to, to people like me and you who, who have this scientific outlook. I think there's that, and there's also the fact that you can play within a form and play with words in a, in a creative way, and it becomes like solving a mathematical problem, doesn't it? Um, yes, it, it begins with the words. I don't poetry and all, Anthony, because how do you come up with, with these, these new forms you've developed where you sort of have reverse palindromes and letter, yet letter units and so on? I think, how does this brain do that? But it's so much fun. It, it, it begins with fun, I think. Yeah. But that's the idea. Just fun. what else can, well, you know, what else can I do? What, <laughs> what, what, other, what hasn't been done before is, is a big motivator. It's also like, you know, when you, when you have a mathematical or physics problem to solve and you can spend weeks and weeks and weeks on it. And then all of a sudden it just kind of falls into place. And I think that's what I find very satisfying about writing within, within these constraints is that sense of I'm working on a, on a creative problem in the same way that it could be a maths problem or a physics problem. Um, it's a creative poetry problem that I'm trying to solve. Yeah, and it, it has the added bonus too that what you end up with is yours still. It still has that creative side to it that you have created something unique. Whereas solving a, a mathematical problem, most of the time it, it's something somebody else has solved or could well, solve. Yes, I I mean, sometimes thought... it isn't, which is, I imagine, I've never had that experience in my life. I imagine that's amazing to prove a theorem that nobody's proved before. No, I've never quite got to that stage in, in mathematics, but uh, well, never got anywhere near that stage, but yeah. And um, I think this is what is interesting with many of the, of, of the pen track press writers is that they're so distinctive and so unique and they're doing their own thing. They're not fitting really into, into any particular poetry mold or poetry school. And I love that. I love the excitement of getting a, a new, interact book and thinking so you know what's going to come out of this and it's always something entertaining and interesting and and very individual thank you we, we look for the best and we have we have published you of course uh, we've had the the honor of publishing fractal poems and and i as the other another honor but i got to blurb your book with Bear Boer, 
from fibs to fractals. So I'm, I'm full of honor. I'm, I'm awash with honor. So, and, and of course, fibs to fractals is where you really, you talk about all the different ways that mathematics can be used in poetry. Yes, it's something again that um, I fell into because my son set up a website for me and I thought, that's great, that's really, I asked him to and he set up his website and I thought, lovely, now I have a website. What am I going to do with it? And you very quickly run out of things to say about yourself and I did some reviews and then I started thinking about form and how well, I start off with the Fibonacci form, which is, which I love, which is so much fun and which has its own journal as well. So you have the Fib Review, where you get all these wonderful variations on, on poetry using the Fibonacci sequence. And so that was the first blog. And then I started looking at others and um, finding out about others and then thinking that actually some of the traditional forms are very mathematical in their structure. In fact, many of the traditional forms are very mathematical in their structure. And so it really arose out of that. Yes, the well, the, the Sestina is a good example of a, a very old form that has this amazing mathematical structure to it. I don't know that much about the life, and I think nobody knows too much about the life of Arno Daniel, but he clearly had some mathematical aptitude. It's, it's not a coincidence that he, he created this pattern. Well, you know, maybe he was a sort of Anthony Ethren of, of his day. But what's interesting about the Sestina is that, um, and I only discovered this when I was researching it, is that there are, you can have the Sestina, you can have the Tritina, which is where you have three words that you can rotate in a certain sequence. But it doesn't work with the every number. So, you can't have, I think, for example, you can't have a sort of tetratina because you can't get the rotations in. Mm. And various, a couple of mathematicians have investigated this and seen what possibilities there are and what are the constraints. And it leads into some quite interesting mathematical theory. And, you know, here's a wee challenge for you, Anthony. I think you can have a 194-tina with 194 end words and do them all in a nice rotation. I don't know if anyone's actually attempted that. That would take a long time. That would take a long time. That would take a long time to write. And you might find that your readership is fairly limited. <laughs> yeah, so you mentioned, you mentioned uh, fibs. Yes. They're called fibs. I, I'll just, to clarify, these are poems that follow the Fibonacci sequence. In some way or another. Mm. Exactly, so you could do it by letter or by syllable or by word. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that taught me is how constrained we are by the page, because the Fib review is purely online, it's an online journal. And it means that you can play around with the shapes and the forms in a way that you can't do on a normal, you know, A4 or A5 or, or whatever size page. So you get these really interesting shapes of the poems that have, you know, rearranged themselves on, on the screen. Yeah, well, it's, it means by, its, by its nature, it's a sequence that quickly gets out of control. You've suddenly got... Yeah, so you can do clusters or you can do... Um, or wine shapes, or all sorts of interesting things. In, in terms of my own work, when I'm thinking about uh, how to combine mathematics and poetry, this is this is in the domain of fibs. Most of the constraints I come up with are, are based on using sequences. So I have the the alindrome. It blew my mind when I first uh, when I first read one of your alindromes, and then figured it out what you're actually doing. I thought, wow, this is just this is just so extraordinary and exciting and interesting. Yeah, so you go ahead and explain it. Well, thank you anyway. About uh, 2011, I realized that you could write palindromes by pairs of letters. Mm -hmm. I think the first one was, I was writing a, a, a palindrome about Einstein and thought it's a shame you can't use the name Einstein in the palindrome. 
And I think because I was also playing around with anagrams a lot, I noticed that, well, if you just go backwards by two every two letters instead of every single letter, you get the word intense. So you can have intense ink Einstein or intense ion Einstein. And so then I started doing palindromes by blocks of three letters and four letters. And then the the idea of the alien drone came about. And the alien drone is essentially you just change the block as you go along. So you could start with one letter reverse. So the one letter at the beginning is the same as the letter at the end. Then the next two letters are the two letters next to that one at the end. And you, you've got an alien drone in one, two, three, four. And then why not bring in, because I, I was obsessed with mathematics, why not bring in numerical sequences from other areas like irrational numbers? So do it according to pi. So you can have an alien drone that starts with the first three letters or the last three letters, then the next one letter goes to the end as well. And you, you've encoded a sequence into a poem, which I, that, that appealed to me. Last year, I came up with a constraint called the slice, where you have, for example, four letters, and then the fifth letter is the letter E, and then another four letters, and then another E. And the only time E appears part of the poem is when it's the fifth, tenth, fifteenth, twentieth letter. And so recently, I realized, okay, well, you could encode a sequence here because you could say, let's have three, again, using pi, three letters that are whatever letters you want. And then the next letter is E, and then one letter that could be any letter you want, and then the next letter is E. So between all these E's, you've got the digits of pi. And then again, I am, I am boring you now. I'm going on too long about this. No, you're not. No, no, I'm loving this. And then you post them on Twitter and say, so guess the constraint. And we all sit there thinking, goodness, me, what's Anthony done now? So I think you did that, didn't you, with the pi and the e constraint? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then the most recent one comes from, see, it's all the, always the same path. Well, I came, I say I came up with, I'll get to why that's not quite true. I came up with a constraint where, you, uh, you know, the re-divider, where mm -hmm. the re-divider poem is, you have two poems that have the same letters in the same order, but yeah. the spacing is different, so that they are different poems. And I thought, well, you could take every pair of letters and switch them around. So the word time becomes item. So TI is switched to IT, uh, ME is switched to EM. So time becomes item. And you could just have a re-divider where every pair of letters is flipped. Uh, I then discovered shortly after posting this on Twitter about nearly a year ago, I then, then learned that uh, this constraint was already invented by somebody else five years ago. Uh, only in Japanese. Oh, really? How yes. interesting. It's a, a Japanese palindromist called Akira Lino. And yeah, and he's already invented this. And he got in touch with me and said, hey, I've done that. And we had a good conversation about it. Uh, but then a few weeks ago, I realized if you, that when you're flipping the two letters, essentially that's creating a tiny palindrome. So you could, if you did it by three letters, you could just invert three letters as part of this flip redivider and then naturally well why not change that just like with the alien drone <laughs> so i have this constraint now called the alien divider where the first three letters of the first poem are the first three letters of the next poem reversed and then the next one letter is the same and and so on and so on i'll have to I have to put i think i'm gonna have to put some links in the description of this podcast so oh, people can see it to, you are going to have to because i i think i need to see this on yeah it's it's hard to hard to describe but uh, my point anyway I'll, I'll get to the point my my point anyway is that these three things that i consider unique constraints that i've devised all operate the same way which is that you start with a conventional constraint so for the alien drone that's the palindrome for the the alien slice, as I'm calling it, it's uh, essentially a type of tautogram. And for the alien divider, it's the re-divider. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's a second stage where I, I develop that constraint into something slightly different. So then you get the palindrome by pairs compared to the palindrome. 
the uh, the slice constraint as opposed to a torsogram. So the slice being the one where it's a few letters, then the letter E, then that same number of letters, then E, and so on. And in the third instance, it was this flipping the two letters in the re divider, which Akira Lino had, had come up with before me anyway. And then the third stage is take these things and run a numerical sequence through it. And I hope people are still listening because that was all very boring and intricate. But <laughs> I, I am building to something. I'm building to a question, I promise. So the question is how else can we make constraints based on mathematics other, th other than? the three ways I've done it, which are essentially all one way, which is just mm -hmm. trying to find a way to take a numerical sequence and attribute that sequence to numbers of letters. I think, um, you know, you can look at shape and, you know, explore the shapes of mathematics, which is something I, I really quite enjoy doing. Well, this is, I mean, this is the essence yeah. of, of your book, with with us uh, fractal poems yes yeah, so there's a there's a they're very much non-sequential in terms of numbers in terms of number sequences but they're, they're all based on fractal patterns yes and yes in different ways so using um using fractal patterns in different ways i did write a sestina that about the Mandelbrot set, but because I'm rubbish at Sestinas, because they go on for so long, it's a Sestina with fuzzy edges, just like the Mandelbrot set has fuzzy edges. Mm. So, you know, there is a sort of Sestina hiding in there, but you actually have to look quite hard to find it. And hopefully the poem can, you know, stand without without you assuming that it's a Sestina. But yeah, shape is, um, shape is one thing I'm trying to think of. Others, it's quite hard to get away from number, isn't it, when we're thinking about constraint, you know, number, even if you think of a sonnet that's got 14 lines. You can get off the page and start working with dimension. And this is an area I've never, I've, I've seen some wonderful results, but never actually explored myself, of um, interactive poems that you can that really only work online because you need to you need to click on the links sort of like a like a computer game. Yeah. Uh, but it lifts the poem off the page and instead of just getting a, a two-dimensional um, two-dimensional structure, you get a multi-dimensional structure within the poem, which is really, really interesting and fun to explore. Yeah, I think this must be the way to do it. I've been trying for years to come up with something that really uses mathematics to use equations. I, I had this one idea that you could, because I was obsessed with calculus, obviously, I, I thought you could find a way to, to uh, differentiate a, a poem into another poem, which, which you could then integrate back to the original. Yeah, just, but what would that mean? You've got so x squared becomes two x. What does that mean? With the poem, so the poem is x there. What, what's going on in the poem that you're? And what, what does it even mean to have a poem that's squared? Well, I guess we are looking at we're looking into further dimensions here. The the two dimensional page is not enough to try to do these things. Yes, well, because if you integrate something, you, you, you're you moving from line to area, aren't you, or mm. area to, to, to the third dimension. Yeah, well, the so fourth. <laughs> well, the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension. Stuff my stuff at three. <laughs> <laughs> it's you're easy. Time, time travel as well, by the right. Yeah, you can easily drive yourself mad. And I think I'm, I may have done that, oh, <laughs> or I'm on the verge of it. There is a whole area of, um, of uh, mathematical poetry that is purely symbolic, using mathematical symbols. And yes. again, really some very interesting results. It's um, Kaz, oh, I can't remember his surname. Um, 
Kaz, I'd have to look up, I'd have to look up the setting. But he writes these symbolic poems, which are often very, very clever. Normally you need to know a little bit of mathematics, like what differentiation is, what integration is, to, for example. And the other thing I really want to write is um, endless fraction, where you have a fraction, you divide like a normal fraction, one divided by two, but then you divide that again by, say, two, and go on and go on and go on. And I really want to try and figure out how to express that poetically. That's interesting. You're giving me all these interesting ideas. <laughs> Reminds me, have you ever seen, have you ever seen Pedro Poitevin's decimas that are equations? No. These are great. He's, he, he challenged himself to write. So essentially he's writing, he's writing, this is all numbers and symbols. But in such a way that if you read it out, I guess in, in Spanish, if you read it out, it follows the form of a decima. It, it has the rhyme scheme of a decima. But the equation makes sense still. It, it still has to be a, an equation that makes sense. And he was he, ch he challenged himself to write the shortest one he could because he was doing it on Twitter. So he wanted to use as few characters as possible to write out an equation that was a poem if you if read out loud. And the equation has to make sense. It's he remarkable. Yeah. Oh, he's so clever. I love his work. Yeah. Well, he's, he's a he is a great mathematician. He's, he is someone who's who's proved things. Yes, he, <laughs> but... he's a proper mathematician. I like me. I just taught it at high school level. But he is a proper mathematician. So there's permutations. So you've, you've dedicated the whole chapter to permutations in from fibs to fractals. Yes, and the there were of course, there were, there were alindromes fitted in there as well, didn't they? And, and um, lipograms, which are where you take a limited number of, of letters and then play around and rearrange. And, and you, you've, written, you've written lipograms, of course, we both, we both have. Yeah. They're fun to write, aren't they? It's, it's the constraint that when, when people say, how do I get started? What do I begin with? I say, I always say lipograms. I always say fibs, but yeah, ah. lipograms are also good. Maybe you could start with a lipogram and write a lipogram fib. Just using the letters of Fibonacci. Well, they're quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I like about lipograms as an introductory constraint is that it's as easy or as hard as you want it to be. You could write a, a lipogram that just doesn't use Q. Yes, well, the very earliest lipogram I think goes back to what was it, sixth century BC, as far as we're aware. Anyway, um, ancient Greek, and it, it seems to have been someone who he was writing songs and didn't like the letter sigma, maybe because it didn't come over well in his in his songs. So he wrote all these pieces omitting the letter sigma. And that's where we started off with lithograms, and then of course they permuted, if you like, or permutated into, into some of the wonderful things like you know, Luke Bradford's Zulalia, which I love, where he yeah. takes Latin names um, of various animals and, and expresses them using only those letters. He, he writes these wonderful little poems. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, an amazing versatile constraint. And, so, and I like that story as well about how it originated, because you can imagine a lot of constraints would come about naturally that way. That, for example, if you if you have a speech impediment and there are certain letters you can't say, and you're a poet, you, you'll just leave those letters out. You know, there's a natural way for a lot. Of, I don't think there's a natural way where, where someone would have to write palindromes, but <laughs> <laughs> but you can see how a lot of them would would have come about naturally rather than because of a drive to do it on any technical level. Well, if you think of meter as a constraint, which of course you can, um, the great advantage is something that's that's metrical. It's much easier to learn off by heart. Mm. That's something that has no, no metrical structure to it. 
Well, I guess that's probably true of palindromes as well, that they're easy to remember because if you know you only have to remember half of it. <laughs> Figure out what the second half is. Yes, I'm thinking. Aren't there some famous palindromes that um that we use as mnemonics? You must know, Anthony. Oh, I don't know. Maybe maybe there aren't any. I'll, I'll put that right. Sort it, sort it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so what what is the appeal of constraints then for, for you? What's what's the reason to do it? I mean, you mentioned that you didn't feel the need to write emotive poetry anymore, so you, but you still wanted to write poetry. But why constraint? What what I, I, still, I still do write emotive poetry, but most of it just stays. Um, stays in my notebooks when I'm having a private rant about something or other. Mm. <laughs> Those are the ones that really shouldn't, you know, get out of the notebook and, and into any sort of public view. But the advantage of constraint, I think, is that they're putting order into chaos, aren't they? There's, um, there seems to be so much chaos going on around us. And if we can use constraints to, to impose some sort of order on that, it's, it's mentally helpful. Hmm. I see that, yeah. I do, I do think that form and content need to work well together. So if I'm writing a flip poem, there needs to be some, even if it's a sort of vagus link, to to what the sequence represents. I recently I wrote a flip poem about snails. And of course, and you can think of Fibonacci spiral and, and as the being approximately equivalent to the um, shell of a snail. Yeah. So those sort of links, and I, I, I like to have some connection, even if it's not immediately obvious. Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. Trying to find a way to make form and subject combined. Yeah. Uh, I still think my the, the best, I've written a few palindromic sonnets, that to me the best one is the, the Frankenstein one, because I'm, I'm leaning into the idea that palindromes are going to sound choppy, and so they're going to sound like little bits stitched together. <laughs> I, I like that. It's nice when you discover these, these, these little things come to you. Oh, I could do this. I could, yeah, it, it just seems to fit. Yes, on the other hand, you know, sometimes your, your constrained writing is also extremely lyrical, kind of transcends the constraint and the music, which I think all, all your writing has a musical value. But um, in some of your best work, it really transcends the constraint and, and sings and sings. Well, thank you. Voice. Thank you. I mean, it is. That's my. It's my second go-to. I think music. The constraint comes first, but then music always comes second. It's a very important thing to me. Uh, me meaning doesn't matter so much to me. So so long as it sounds good, I can let meaning go a bit. Well, uh, I do pay attention to it, but it's not as important, I think, as as the structure and the melody. But there's always a there's always a coherence, or almost always a coherence. Yeah. When you're writing. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I have to give up on that. If, if, coherence. Yeah. If, if the constraint is extremely tough, then I then I have to to say, okay, this one is not going to mean anything. It's just it's just going to be its uh, own abstract piece. But yeah, certainly, it, I do like to use meaning if it's possible, for sure. Yes, I'm not really able to step away from, from meaning in that sense, but then I don't work with the same sort of rigorous constraints that you do. I, th I think you should try it. It's, it's quite good fun to, to let it go. It's, it's very, it feels unsettling, but it, it has, it gives you other things, you know, it, it, it's very satisfying in its own way. I wouldn't want to just write works like that. I don't, I don't quite understand poets who just want to write completely asemic works but it's nice to do it occasionally so I mean I, what I tend to do is if I've written written something 
like you know my my chapbook beauty sonnets which is probably the most extreme thing i've done in that direction if i write something like that then for the next months i'm just trying to write meaningful coherent lyrical works but then i get bored of that and i have to go back to a a, a more asemic syntactically weird challenge so i bounce back and forth but do you find that at all oh absolutely um probably more extreme than, than you do. But when I start on a project, I get very involved in it. And it becomes mentally, mentally quite intense. And then when I, I finished, oh, I'm back writing little emotive free verse, things that mostly stay in my notebooks. Why? I, I think you know, I, I wonder why you don't share those. I have shared some. Um, I think what, what one of the things about doing a creative writing degree is, is you, certainly the one I did, was that the focus is all on, if you like, poetry that fits into the normal distribution of poetry. Mm. And of course, because there are so many poets writing these, you know, wonderfully crafted, deeply emotional, perspective, lyrical pieces of work, it's very hard to, to feel that you can contribute in that area. So when I discovered that there were outliers, people writing mathematical poetry or, or um, people using intense constraints. This was so exciting because I thought, I'm actually much more happy in that outlier zone because it allows me to be myself and, and, and to play around with different aspects, not just, not just within the words. Is that making any sense, Andy? It does, yeah. I mean, it's interesting you say, you it lets you be yourself and that's definitely true you get to, you when you're playing around with words you get to express yourself that way in a non-direct way uh, but at the same time you get to not be yourself which is very interesting too uh, especially the heavier the constraint it's like someone else is speaking because you're not saying what you want to say you're saying what the constraint wants to say so that can be fun too i think this is probably what i was saying a minute minutes ago about how i bounce back and forth between wanting my voice to come through and to write a lyrical poem despite the constraints and then wanting to pile the constraints on so that it's not me speaking i just i don't know what's going to happen i don't know what words are going to come out of this so I think you said something like that um when discussing your book fabric didn't you that when you're working with heavy constraints you can write yourself out of the poem completely mm. and there's also something isn't there about hiding away behind constraints yeah you're, you're not putting your heart on the line for everyone to yes. judge you know exactly. exactly yeah i've been thinking lately about i've been trying to write a small essay on this about and i've called the two types organic constraints and inorganic constraint so organic constraint is when you try to defeat the constraints and write something lyrical in spite of it and inorganic constraint is when you give yourself over to, to this uh inhuman voice that the constraint demands and it's obviously determined by how strict the constraint is i think which way it goes but sometimes sometimes even with a lighter constraint it's nice to just see, see what the letters and the words have to say for themselves i think would an organic constraint not be more where the form and the content are working together could, so, could interpret it that way what i was saying about you know, writing about a Fibonacci poem about snails because that's inherent in the Fibonacci in the Fibonacci form, and that to me is quite organic. Yeah, and that's it. I was thinking more in terms of the uh, human versus inhuman life. <laughs> organic, organic. <laughs> but that's yes, true. Yeah, it's a, a as a in terms of being a coherent whole, but subject and form united. Definitely, that's. You could call that organic. I don't know. I'm just throwing words around, trying to figure. Out. I'm trying to find terms to label things that that 
really don't lend themselves to terms. Well, I definitely feel those. I definitely feel those two. Those two opposing forces that there's the desire to let the constraint win to say that the constraint is the master and I am the servant, or the constraint is the servant and I am the master. Maybe maybe organic and inorganic isn't the best aren't the best labels for those. I'm thinking now, coming back to mathematics, is it not more like pure and applied mathematics? Where the pure mathematics is really math just called the sheer interest and, and, and intellectual challenge of, and applied mathematics, you know, can be useful for building wind turbines or whatever. Yeah, I like that. That, that's very good. I suppose the one problem with it is that when by calling it applied, that implies utility. Whereas I think I think all poems are all poems are useless, really. It's one of the nice things about them. It does make me laugh when people say poetry is so important. And this is such an important poem because of what it says about whatever's going on in the world at the moment. Yeah. Poetry is part of the share learning to deal with life and enjoy life and celebrate life but important exactly you see that i think that's the problem i other than that i really like the terms you've given it but applied <laughs> it, it, it implies that 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 the poems are useful and i'm not sure <laughs> well of course applied mass can also be a model of something that could potentially be useful in certain circumstances but the number of constraints true Okay, you can keep arguing this case. It could, I'm, I'm... Be, it could be pure mathematics and mathematical modeling. Well, model, modeling constraint. So yeah, I'm pushing this entry. <laughs> uh, but the terms are out there somewhere. I'll find them. But you, you're not impressed by organic and inorganic because of the, the double meaning of those, both of those words, I guess. Well, I am, but I would interpret them in the, in the, way, um, the way I did organic to me implies something that's in some way a unified whole. Yeah. And you're the one who study chemistry. I never got further than GCSE for chemistry. Well, I'm, I'm thinking too simplistically anyway, I think when I, when I use the analogy with chemistry, because I'm just thinking, well, organic matter, so things that are alive and inorganic matter, it's an alien life. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll figure this out. I'll figure this out. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is this podcast is meant to be about you, not my my problems with no, the essay I'm writing. Reading this essay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well let's let, let's move on to a, a completely different subject. So I, I really do want to talk to you about this. Uh, we, we both obviously share passions for poetry and mathematics, but there's something else we're both obviously obsessed with, which is cricket. And I don't get to talk about cricket with many poets because most of the poets I know are from North America. What do they know? <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, baseball. Yeah. Just not cricket. Nothing about and don't care about. So, yes, let's talk about cricket. Yeah. Talk about your cricket. My cricket? Well, my, my relationship to cricket. I've not seen any of your poems about cricket. I only have one poem about cricket. It's a palindrome. I'll, I'll have to show it to you at some point. Maybe, maybe later today. Do you play cricket? I, I've never played cricket to any kind of standard. I've played it, but not well. I, I was, uh, as a batsman, I was a slogger. Uh -huh. I tried to hit every ball for six, which was kind of the modern way. So I was, I was ahead of my time. I just didn't have the talent. And as a bowler, I was a leg spinner. Okay. And I could turn the ball a long way. I had that going for me. I had a googly, that was, which also turns quite a lot. The trouble was that that's no good if you're bowling a meter if the ball's landing a meter outside off stump every time no. or a meter outside leg stump i was essentially i had no accuracy this was the problem i think it's a problem when you when you're a leg spinner anyway and you're just trying to turn the ball as much as you can you're not really looking at where it's landing so yeah i was no good did you did you, did you ever play do you play oh goodness no i mean where i grew up it was definitely not a girl's sport in the time and place where I grew up. And I always used to think cricket was deadly boring. And then of course I had, you know, we had four boys. 
And they started, or the, the eldest one started playing cricket. And as a mom, you have to go along and watch. And this was in the Middle East, so it ended up that I was transporting half the cricket team. And um, so you, you kind of get drawn into it. And then, of course, Zimbabwe used to play cricket at a good standard. And beating so, England in the 90s. Yeah. I mean, it, was, it was a particularly bad England team. <laughs> <laughs> those, were, those were the halcyon days. But um, yeah, so that, that's how my interest in cricket started. And I, I dare not ask you if, if you support Zimbabwe or England. I think you've just given the answer. <laughs> oh, if you're going to get the John Major test on me, it's definitely Zimbabwe even though I haven't lived there since 1975. Well, I haven't lived there, but um, yeah, I left, I left in 1975. But the other issue I have with cricket is its governance, is that it's become so dominated by England and India and Australia. And the other teams, and they play far too much together. And the other teams, um, you know, New Zealand sort of hangs in there and plays lovely cricket. But the other teams have, um, they tend to get pushed to the sidelines. So yeah. more and more, I've discovered that the cricket I really enjoy is village cricket. So if you were still playing, Anthony, and if you were playing village cricket, I would come and watch. Because that's where the real entertainment is. I was going to say you'd be disappointed, but I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, I'll, give, maybe I'll give you a good laugh. <laughs> well, it, it's so. Um, it's so quintessentially relaxing, isn't it? When you rock up on some little village green somewhere and you know, there'll be somebody keeping wicket who's 82 with dodgy knees and the opening bowler will be a 12-year-old from the local school and there'll be ridiculous runouts and but it's all so much fun. And it has proper teas. Yeah, oh, you, you're making me want to sign up to my local club. Oh, you should do. Why <laughs> not? So it's a great ground. It's a great ground. They've got. They have a a radio telescope that's part of the Jodrell Bank series. Really, it's right, right next to the cricket ground. So I'd be playing cricket underneath a, a radio telescope. Oh, I don't know why I don't do it. I would definitely come and watch. Yeah. If I lived anywhere near Shropshire, but so. Oh, come visit. <laughs> but I can't guarantee I'll be playing. I, I, I found some that because I thought I'd have a look into the relationship between poetry and cricket since I was talking mm -hmm. to you. And I found something really funny. It, did you know that uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle played cricket and in fact played, he played 10 first class matches? For the MCC. I did not know that. And I also, I should have known this, but as well as writing Sherlock Holmes, he did also write books of poetry, which I didn't know. I didn't know that either. Under, under his name? Yes, yeah. And yeah, so he, he played 10 first class matches, all for the MCC, and he only took one wicket in that short career. But the wicket he took was W.G. Grace. <laughs> One of the most famous cricketers of all time for, Absolutely. For, our, for our North American listeners who have probably stopped listening. <laughs> and he wrote, a po he wrote a poem about it. He, he bowled three deliveries to W.G. Grace and obviously got him out on the third one. And a few years later, he wrote a poem and I've got it printed off here. You can see it. It's 19 stanzas long <laughs> describing <laughs> these, three, these three balls he bowled to W.G. Grace. And it's mad. And I'm going to read a bit of it. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Don't worry. I'll, I'll put a link to this in the description. Because oh, yes. everybody should read this. It starts. Once in my heyday of cricket, one day I shall ever recall, I captured that glorious wicket, the greatest, the grandest of all. And then the next, the next three stanzas just describe W.G. Grace. Before me, he stands... Quite a formidable figure, wasn't he? <laughs> so, 
This is funny. Before me he stands like a vision, bearded and burly and brown, a smile of good humoured derision, as he waits for the first to come down. A statue from Thebes or from Knossos, a Hercules shrouded in white, a Syrian bull-like colossus, he stands in his might. With the beard of a goth or a vandal, his bat hanging ready and free, his great hairy hands on the handle, and his menacing eyes upon me. Why is this <laughs> not in every single anthology? <laughs> it makes me want to write cricket poetry, though. It just well, yes. The absurdity of it, too. This, he's just bowling a ball to a man with a bat, but no, it's, he's a colossus. He, he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's a god. <laughs> There is some famous poem, isn't there, about um, cricket, which you've probably got to have, and I can't remember, but we did it at school. Last man in, or nine wickets down. How does it go? Who wrote it, Anthony? You must oh, I don't know. I, I do know what you mean, though. It, it rings a bell. I can't, I can't remember it. We'll find it. We'll find it. We'll find it, yes. I did, I did once start writing as a cricket sestina and this is a problem with sestinas i have you know obviously i've got to hang up about them because they look so amazing and you know such a fun such a fun poetic challenge but you run out of ideas you know after about three stanzas goodness knows where i'm good how am i going to write another 21 lines <laughs> So I have started writing a, a, a cricket sestina and then it ran out of energy and it never got further than... Well, I hope you finish it. That would be, that would be wonderful. I wrote... Cricket does feature one of my poems, which is in the Book of Pinterest. Eleven's is. Should I read it? If you like, yes. Because I have it here. It's the one that mentions TMS, isn't it? Which is always that's right, that's right. You must mention TMS, <laughs> greatest radio show ever. Absolutely. This was actually written, it's a little bit of a cheek because it was written during lockdown, the first lockdown, so there wasn't any cricket, but it was perfect cricket weather. So I invented, I invented cricket in the firm, also because, of course, cricket you play with 11. 11, uh, 11 players per team, and the poem has 11 syllables per line and 11 lines, and it's called Elevenses. Squeezed awkwardly between the round completeness of 10 and factored convenience of 12, 11 is the odd one out. We don't have 11 fingers or toes. We never buy eleven rolls or eggs or long-stemmed roses for our lover. In binary notation, its digits become the three of us, on our terrace with coffee and scones and the sunlight and bird song of June. While the radio plays test match special, and eleven extends its parallel arms towards the unbounded sky. It's a great poem. And obviously, now you know, as soon as I saw Test Match Special mentioned, I thought, I'm, I'm putting that in the anthology. That's, that's definitely going to be. Well, I didn't know you were into cricket because you never comment on the cricket on Twitter. I should, I should comment more. I think, uh, but I think I worry that if I started. Probably not on the last ODI. No, we don't talk about that. <laughs> what last ODI? <laughs> yeah. the, the Test Match team is doing a lot better. That's, that's been pleasing. Yes, that's been, that's been entertaining and good fun and um, very energised. Yeah. Well, what are your feelings on Test Cricket versus 2020? If you'd asked me that two or three years ago, I would have said Test Cricket. And I probably would still say Test Cricket, but I think we can't get away from 2020, which has become, which is really... The dominant force in cricket, hasn't it? Yeah. With the the Indian IPL, there was a lovely story. Did you see it? 
about um, a cricket scam where some, I think in India, some organization invented, invented a, a T20 tournament and took bets on it and made huge amounts of money. And it was all completely fabricated. There wasn't any cricket and there was no tournament, but they, I think they, they made a lot of money on this wonderful betting scam. And I think really that's what 2020 deserves. <laughs> Having said that at the moment, um, there's a 2020 qualifier going on in Zimbabwe as we speak. And Zimbabwe obviously are playing and the two teams that, that end up winning and, and being runner up in this competition will go forward to the T20 World Cup, which is later this year. October, is it? I think so, yeah. October. So obviously, you know, I'm desperate for Zimbabwe to succeed and prepare for disappointment, which is what comes with the territory of being a Zimbabwe supporter. Oh, I'm being an England supporter too. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> How do you feel about test cricket? It's the it's the main thing. It, it's still the main deal, and I, I feel that there, there's a relationship between cricket and, and poetry. Not not just because of your lovely poem and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's weird poem, <laughs> but when people say they don't like it because it's boring, people tend to say say that about poetry too and I don't I wouldn't deny it with either I think test cricket can be boring poetry can be boring but it's what's so good about both of them is that uh, throughout these moments of tedium you suddenly get something that grabs you and makes you pay attention and I think that makes both poetry and cricket a lot like life because most of life is not necessarily boring but most of life is that is uneventful and then suddenly things happen and there's something about test cricket that really captures that it's not i mean because 2020 is fun but it doesn't it doesn't draw me in the way a test match does this this long epic struggle i think you know there is a 20 a, a t20 influence on test cricket now isn't there and to some extent that's changed the dynamics of a test match. Again, if, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if uh, England had been given, I can't remember what they had to make in the last test. Anyway, it was a lot, oh, yeah, a lot of runs. 290 something, yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of runs. And probably 10, 15, 20 years ago, they would have played out for a draw. Do you not think, Anthony? Mm. It has changed it. But yeah. it, test cricket, it, it's still test cricket, though, that you, you still do, even in these recent matches where England, England has taken this attacking approach, there are still lots of quiet moments and slow play and umpires walking around slowly. <laughs> well, the quiet moments can be the most interesting, really, in some ways, can't they? Where... Yeah, definitely. And this is what I'm saying. It's true with poetry, too. There's a lot of mind games going on, I imagine. Yeah. And again, that's true of poetry. We're, we're always playing mind games with the reader. I think uh, some of the best poems are poems that are 50% boring and just punctuated by these amazing moments. <laughs> yeah, there's, not, there's not enough epic poetry these days. I'm thinking of Virgil, I was in that, because um, I recently sat down with some friends and we started going through translating the Aeneid or bits of the Aeneid. And yes, there are some boring bits, and then there are some wonderfully, you know, quite extraordinarily dramatic, mm. dramatic bits. But an abridged version that just had the, the fun bits and the dramatic bits wouldn't be as good, because you, you do need the tedium. I think people these days uh, avoid tedium at all costs, when, when you shouldn't. It's, it's important there to put things in context. So I'm, I, I'm, this is a weird position to take, perhaps, but I'm advocating tedium. That's a problem with Twitter, though, isn't it? 
There are lots of problems with Twitter. Oh, there are lots of problems with Twitter, but you know, you sort of scroll through, scroll through, looking for something, you know, exciting and interesting, and perhaps miss things that are more, more profound. Mm. Don't sort of flash at you in your in your Twitter feed, metaphorically speaking. Most of the most of the time, <laughs> it's the way. So I think it's probably the way we're being conditioned now, which is why we're going to watch 2020 cricket more than test cricket we have shorter attention spans and it's the way the world is uh, teaching us to be so the antidote to that is to just sit back put test match special on <laughs> open the bottle of wine and just <laughs> soak in the day <laughs> absolutely especially in this weather definitely yeah definitely cricket weather so uh, we'll get getting back to your work can we talk a bit about what's what you're working on now and what and what might be coming up? What I'm working on now is actually catching up with things that I lots of boring administrative things that I should have done ages ago. So basically not much poetry, lots of boring emails. But I do have, if I may mention, a book coming up with you next year. Yeah. Which was enormously fun to write. And that comes across. I can see you're yes. you know, yes, playing okay. with lot, playing with lots of different constraints, yes. lots of different ideas. It's, it is a fun book to read. It seems oh, well, I know that comes through because I had so much fun actually writing it. Um, a lot of fun things I wrote, well, things were a lot of fun for me. I ended up not putting in the book because I thought these are really just too weird. But they were great. They were great fun, but they didn't quite fit in the framework. Yeah, so that was that was really, really fun. And um, obviously it's mathematically constrained, it's geometrically constrained, but not only geometrically, because there are also number constraints in there, but mostly it's just a lot of fun. There's a 25 word poem that took me three weeks to write. Those are the so, best poems. <laughs> so I don't know how you do it, Anthony, because you write all these amazing, Sort of dazzling constrained poems. You just seem to write, you know, dozens per week. Um, you know, your email that you started, your, your newsletter that you started, the first time that, that you sent out. Well, they're not all, all new. Oh, wow, so much fun. <laughs> I, I found that the best way, I should ask you about this too, because I think this is interesting. The way I write is is to get something down as quickly as possible. So even if it's no good, just get a complete poem down as quickly as I can, because otherwise I won't finish it. Given the nature of all, everything that goes into a highly constrained poem, I just try to do it as quickly as possible. And then once it's there, I can take as long as I want to, to polish it up and get all the other so, Even if it's not perfect. Yeah, I, I have I have to make sure I've got something there. I know people who will happily spend days, weeks, years even. They're just going through it from beginning to end. And it takes as long as it takes. I can't do that because I would give up. So I make sure I get something down, a complete poem down, even if it's no good. Then I can go back into it and change it so that it is good. Uh, we all work differently. And I, I think uh, that's just the way I go about it. But certainly I know lots of people who would take the opposite approach and they make sure that they spend ages working on the first word. Is that the right first word? Yes. Okay. What's the second word? Spend ages on that. <laughs> Which way do you go? Are you asking for my method? Yeah. Chaotic is probably the best response. Um, every so often, um, once in a blue moon, the poem is just there. Oh yeah, those those moments are, and and those very, are very good. precious moments. You have to write it down straight away, otherwise it, you know, goes away with the clouds. Which has meant that in the middle of the night I've had to get up and yeah, you know, find a piece of paper because I'm not good at writing on my phone and and um, write it down. But alas, that doesn't happen very often. But it, my poems normally start with a concept or an idea. And the concept can be 
I need to work with the shape or I need to work with the sequence. And then I spend a lot of time trying to think how to fit it all together. And I will write down bits, maybe write down phrases and then try and piece it all together, a bit like a finding bits of a jigsaw puzzle and then putting them together. Does that make sense? Mm. Oh, absolutely. Well, it doesn't sound too dissimilar to me that, that there is a mixture of, of chaos and order going on. So we can say that this this book, I think we can say now it's, it's going to come out in April 2023. It's called yeah. Triangulations. Mm -hmm. It's a giveaway in the title. Yeah, that's really what it's about. It's about triangles and all sorts of um, all sorts of different ways. Sometimes it can be a triangle of place. It can be a triangle of numbers, triangle shapes. And it's hugely fun to write. And Zimbabwe features in there, and various other places feature in there. Pythagoras features in there, obviously. Foxes and owls feature in there. Crochet features. And of course, fractals. So, yeah, there's. There's a lot of variety, which I always like. You know, you've taken a theme, a, a simple theme, and found all these different avenues to explore. I'm really excited about publishing this. Oh, thank you. So, Marion, thank you so much for doing this and for talking to me. I really like the fact I got to talk about cricket on this podcast for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's been a lot of fun, Anthony. Thank you. And um, I shall have to go and look up Arthur Conan Doyle's poem about W.G. Grace. <laughs>